today. This is Ethics in 15 Minutes, part of University Research Week. Um, so we at the Park Center for Ethics are putting this on. Um, we're located right upstairs in the philosophy department, concerned with ethics. Um, so today you're going to hear from four wonderful speakers, um, three of which are members of our graduate fellow cohort, so grad students who work with us, and then one um, speaker is on our staff, um, and you all see here from him. So you're going to hear a bunch of different um, like wide-ranging talks that have to do with philosophy, with politics, with religion. Um, so I hope it's enjoyable and you are excited about it. The way it's going to run is um, we want to keep it quick so we all stay engaged. So I've challenged our speakers, um, 15 minute presentations. Um, if we go over 15 minutes, I'm not going to like do anything wild, but um, we will stick to 15 minutes. Um, I'll be giving some hand signals to our speakers so they know, so you get a taste of what they are researching and what they're working on. Um, and after a speaker, we will have, um, we have two undergraduate students who are working with us in the PAR Center. So you'll get to hear both from our graduate students and our staff member, like big PhD level research you can do with ethics. And then from our students in between, you'll hear um, how you can get involved today if you're not already involved and what you can do with the PAR Center to study ethics now. Um, and my name is Sally, didn't already introduce myself. Um, I'm the director of undergraduate programming at the Far Center. So I get to hang out with a bunch of undergrads and we work on ethics together in various ways which you'll hear about soon. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Hassan. So Hassan is a teaching fellow and a PhD candidate in the Department of Religious Studies at UNC. Bridging architectural theory with critical discourse on religion, his work offers a multidisciplinary model for interpreting the spatial dimensions of ethics. His research contributes to the study of the material culture of religion by examining the link between identity politics and the political economy of space. Hassan has received recognition from institutions such as the University of Miami, uh, Dumbarton's Oaks Mellon Initiative and Rashan Cultural Heritage Institute. His work has been published in the American Academy of Religions Reading Religion, um, Iran Natmag, or Namag, and um, Maiden. Asan also work also serves as a graduate fellow at the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, which we won't hold against him too much. <laughs> Um, but we are very excited to hear from him. So without further ado, thanks. Here, one for me here. Um, how many of you have heard about Kant? Okay, everyone. Very nice. Who has heard about um, William James? Okay, good number. Very nice. Okay, so I'm going to combine the two. And see what happens. <laughs> At least. All right. So I want to talk about cosmopolitan ethics and the idea of pluralism. Well, you would ask how these two go together. We'll see. What can I know? What I ought I to do? What may I hope? Kant finishes his trilogy of questions with hope. Um, some have called Kant the philosopher of hope, incidentally. We are going to focus on his hope for perpetual peace. Kant's cosmopolitanism is a squarely positioned his, in his optimism. I will introduce his 1795 treatise toward perpetual peace, where Kant lays out the condition of possibility for cosmopolitan politics. Now, what does it mean to be cosmopolitan? 
a Latinized form of Greek cosmopolitan citizen of the world. From cosmos or world and politics, uh, politics, politics in a way of polis, of city, of city politics. Already the tension between two conceptions of world comes to full light when we think about this. One might think of the cosmos as a series of close communities, potentially each hostile to the other, or else cosmos as a single community, a single moral community as Kant would call it, albeit composed of different political entities. What I want you to pay attention here is the interplay between um, hostile and hospitable. And I will explain why that is important. Athenians uh, didn't thought of themselves much as cosmopolitan, unfortunately. It was rather conceptualized Athens was conceptualized as a closed political sphere. Only citizens of Athens enjoyed full privileges secured by the law. Socrates, you all remember, in his trial for corrupting the Athenian youth, refused to be persecuted as an Athenian. He said he demanded to be persecuted as a stranger, as a foreigner. He points, his point was that those who accused him, the accusation, didn't understood his language. They so said, I'm not going to be um, interrogated by you because your language is not what I'm talking to and about. There is no shared horizon, as if well, no logos between us. You think that you understand me, but you don't. The first important philosophical cosmopolitanism can be praised, uh, traced to the Socrates of the third century, already influenced by cynics. For Stoics, the cosmos is a kind of scale of polis, like a polis that is governed by law, the cosmos too follows laws of reason. Stoics, nonetheless, had set themselves a grave task to make everyone happy. But you cannot literally help everyone. Namely, you cannot serve the universal human community as such. Whether you want to serve humanity through involvement in politics or serving as a private teacher of virtue, as a philosopher, you will be more effective if you move away from your own limited polis. So they thought it's better because you cannot teach everyone, you need to be engaged in politics somehow, and to do that, you need to go out. The second philosophical cosmopolitanism was put forth by Immanuel Kant in Toward Perpetual Peace in 1795 treaties. The text is structured in two major sections. Section one, containing the preliminary articles for perpetual peace among the states, and section two, containing the definitive articles for perpetual peace among the states. But what is the relationship between peace and cosmopolitanism? Kant regards all rational beings as members of a single moral community. But by this single global community, Kant does not wish to abolish all nations and states. In the second definitive article, he demands that, quote, the law of nations shall be found on a federation of free states. Federation of free states. Now, do you see already there is a trace of the relationship between cosmopolitanism and pluralism? If you are talking about federation of many states, meaning we are recognizing many instead of one. By which he means each of them, each of these states or nations, may and should, for the sake of its own security, 
demand that the others enter with it into a constitution similar to the civil constitution, for under such a constitution, it can be secure in his right. This would be a League of Nations, League of Nations, but it would not have to be a state consisting of nations. So a League of Nations, a provable entity with all of these states being into a federation, having one constitution governing all. Kant hence articulates what form of political relations will guarantee the condition of possibility of perpetual peace. It is in the next move that Kant speculates on what it takes for humanity to forge a single peaceful community. So one is the level of politics, nations. One is the level of in, uh, interrelations between humans. In the first move, Kant delineates parameters of cosmopolitan politics for the states. And for the second aim, he promotes the notion of hospitality. But differently, the first, first level is about cosmopolitan politics of global citizenship. The second is about cosmopolitan ethics of hospitality. In today's simple terms, one is about juridical international law. The other is about global ethical culture. Let us begin with the first level. In the preliminary articles, he enumerates different conditions for perpetual peace among nations, such as the following. No independent state, large or small, shall come under the domination, domination of another state by inheritance, exchange, purchase, or donation. Standing armies shall in time be totally abolished. Just pay attention. Armies should be abolished. No state shall by force interfere with the constitution or government of another state. Good to know. <laughs> In the second section, which concerns us here, he starts with rather sad news. We humans are not that great. That is, all that we are not all that peaceful in the state of nature. And that is why, precisely, the state of nature should be supplanted by the state of culture and law. And the problem is, as you would see, the idea of civilizational missions can be embedded in this, in this poem. The section two containing the definite article for perpetual peace among the states the start as follows. This is the bad news. The state of peace among men living side by side is not the natural state. The natural state is one of war, meaning we cannot live peacefully. This does not always mean open hostilities, but at least an unceasing threat of war. The state of peace, therefore, must be established. For in order to be secured against hostility, it is not su sufficient that hostility simply not be committed. And unless this security is placed with each other by neighbors, I think that can occur only in a civil state. Each may treat his neighbor, uh, um, treat his neighbor from whom he demands the security as an enemy. We will treat our neighbors as an enemy. Okay. Therefore, he, he goes on and says the civic constitution that we need to have is a Republican one, meaning in a French Republican sense of freedom, of equality, of rights, of freedom, and of reason. We all are citizens, we have dignity, and so forth. Now, the law of world citizenship Kant argues, shall be limited to conditions of universal hospitality. Now, limited to condition of universal hospitality. What does it mean? Here, as in preceding articles, Kant says, it is not a question of philanthropy, but of right. Hospitality means of right of a stranger not to be treated as an enemy when he arrives in the land of another, 
one may refuse to receive him when he come uh, when this can be done without causing his destruction but as so long as he peacefully occupies his place one may not treat him with hostility it is not right to be a permanent visitor a special arrangement should be done for that but it is the right only of temporary sojourn a right to associate which all men have they have to be by virtue by the common positions of the surface of the earth whereas globe they cannot indefinitely disperse and hence must definitely tolerate and presence the presence of each other tolerant the presence of each other where have we heard that term that call for tolerance in religious tolerance so let me move on faster now there is there is a contradiction already on one hand you have us as hospitality but at the same time you have a limited hospitality and it is already in the in the latin roots of hostis meaning a stranger in a classical use is classified as enemy so already you have an enemy and a friend uh, encompassed in one uh, term now Now, let me just um, say that, you know, he was trying to, Kant was trying to create a world citizenship, but he was very critical of colonialism. He said, this is not cool that we go around that we call people, sorry, people here, they don't exist. We don't treat them as they never have been there. So this is his call for um, critique of colonialism. Interesting. Now, very quickly, pluralism, pluralism. What pluralism is? Pluralism has multiple levels. One is ontological, meaning existence as such, metaphysics as such is plural. The other is experiential, meaning we are all different and we experience things differently. The third level is epistemological, meaning because you are different and reality is in itself different, so knowing the difference is also multiple. Now, William James, I will end with this quote. His philosophy wants to go against monism. Monism said is a philosophy that says only one is true, only my God is the best God, etc. etc. And I will end up with this, um, which is a wonderful um, quotation of him. Since victory and defeat must be the victory to the philosophical parade, or it's that the more inclusive side of the side which even the hour of triumph with to some degree do justice to the ideas, ideals in which the vanquished party's interest lay. The course of history is nothing but the story of men's struggle from generation to generation to find the more and more inclusive order. Kant invite some manners of realizing your own ideals, which, all, which will also satisfy the alien demands. That and that only is the path to peace. Thank you. All right. <laughs> sort of. It's hard. <laughs> I can do it. Thank you so much. Um, so we won't have Q and A after each person. We're gonna lower this. Oh no way! Sorry. It was in my mind too. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're not gonna have Q and A between each, but we're afterwards gonna have a chance in case you have questions or thoughts for our speakers. So next, um, we have one of our students who works with the Park Center for Ethics. He's gonna tell you about one of the ways he's involved with ethics research in the Park Center now. Um, so Ash, do you wanna come on up? I don't have too much to say because we are kind of a new pod, but we are the partisan ethics pod, and we're kind of talking about a lot of the same stuff that um, we just discussed and what Alex will be talking about. But it is this idea of finding common language or at least understanding of different kind of political languages and perspectives and everything. 
So the long-term goal is to uh, collect information and research to try and build an understanding of how polarizing or contentious topics are like usually framed or discussed, how people engage in these things, whether or not that's effective. It seems pretty evident recently that it's not going well for us. So we're trying to maybe help that out. Um, recently, we had an event about the new Chappelle comedy special. Um, had a pretty good turnout in that, and people had very different opinions on how it should be received or interpreted. Um, but nobody fought each other or anything, so it was it was a good event. Um, we do have an Instagram. I think we're working on a Twitter. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or find us there. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So our next speaker uh, is Gabriella. Gabriella is a third year PhD student um, in our philosophy department. She works primarily on ethics and is especially interested in ethical questions about how we oft relate to and interact with one another. Yeah. Yep. So, what I am going to do is I'm going to try and convince you that calling out is uh, not only morally permissible, but morally worthwhile. This was the topic of my, my master's thesis, and I still think it's good. So, that's what I'm going to do. So, first I want to introduce you to the, the cast, the dramatist personae. Um, so we have the caller, so that's the person who does the calling out. We have the callee, uh, the person who, who did the act, which is it's being called out, they're being addressed by the call out. And then, um, as I'll, I'll discuss, I believe, in the next slide, we have the audience, uh, because I think calling out is a fundamentally public act, as contrasted with something like calling in. So I think there has to be an audience that is at least, that's some third person at least. Okay. So there's a lot of the standard kind of critical gloss on, on calling out is that it's armchair activism, it's like mob mentality, or even worse, the woke mob mentality, um, that it's, it's just this kind of pernicious feature of our, our modern culture. And I don't think that's true. Um, I think that calling out has been something that's been going on for a long time. I would actually say that something like Martin Luther nailing his theses to the door, that would constitute a call out on my view, but I'm gonna be focusing on, on more modern examples. So I wanna argue that we should have a minimal definition of what calling out is. So I don't think it should come with a lot of baggage. I think it should just be understood as a form of moral address, as a way of talking to other people. So, I argue that, that calling out has three essential features. When I say argue, I'm not actually gonna give you an argument for that, I'm just going to assume them. So the first feature is that call outs involve asserting a negative moral judgment about a specific action, uh, which the caller says, and assume that the caller is right, uh, just for the, the sake of uh, convenience here, that violated a moral norm. So the colleague did something that violated a moral norm, and the caller says, hey, you did that thing and it violated a moral norm. Feature two um, is that call-ups are, are public and they occur in front of an audience. So if you like, your friend does something really embarrassing and you like drag them into the bathroom and you're like, oh my God, what did you just do? That's not a call-out, that's something else. Um, so it can be an audience of one. Um, I think call-ups probably most of us are very familiar with online call-ups, so that can be a really large audience. Um, but the size of the audience, at least for the purposes of this presentation, is not important. And the third feature um, is that the call-out has to be addressed to the colleague. This is what turns, this is what makes it go from just being the assertion of a negative moral judgment to a form of moral criticism. Uh, so I can assert a negative moral judgment about somebody, but I'm not really criticizing them until I, I address it to them. 
Okay. So I think to understand what calling out is and why it's morally valuable, it helps to think of what the caller's communicative project is. Um, and I'm gonna argue that that communicative project is to draw the callee's attention to the fact that the called out action can be described in a certain way, described as transgression of a moral norm. Um, so, and also to give the colleagues some information about the moral impermissibility of that, that action or acts of that type. So, and with the goal that the colleague will, as I'll explain, put two and two together and get four, realize, oh, I should not have done that. So to accomplish that communicative project, the caller needs to do two things. They need to get, get a description of the called out action out there and to, uh, to give the colleague information about the moral impermissibility of acts of that type. Okay, so crucially, so what kind of information you might be asking? There are, there are lots of information that somebody could give about moral permiss permissibility or impermissibility. I think that what's communicated in a call out is um, what I call morally salient information. So crucially, morally salient information is not, not moral. There's no, it's not like the categorical imperative or anything like that. It's um, sociological information, historical information, psychological, first personal. So like, ouch, that really hurt me when you, when you did that. Or when you talk like this, that leads other people to think that that sort of behavior towards this particular marginalized group is okay. Um, so that's not moral information, but it's morally relevant to the permissibility of say, talking about blood and soil in immigration debates or whether or not you kick somebody in front of you to get the next like PS5 or whatever. Um, so this morally salient information is something that the caller thinks, well, the colleague must have not had access to this information because if they did and they were reasoning appropriately, they wouldn't have done what they did. Um, so I'm going to give that information to them if I'm, I'm the caller. Um, and I think that morally salient information, and this is probably connected to its being non-moral, it's inert. So the colleague isn't obligated to put two and two together to make four. There's the strong suggestion that if you believe that you ought to treat other people in a certain way or avoid doing acts of a certain kind that you should, the colleague should put two and two together. Um, but that's not, it's like Ikea, it doesn't come already assembled, you have to build it yourself. Okay, so again, so thinking back to the communicative project, so a call out is going to do, do three things. It's gonna describe the called out action as a certain type of act. Um, so something like a racist act or an act that causes unnecessary pain. It's, there's gonna be the explicit assertion of some morally salient information that's, that's relevant to the moral permissibility of the called out action. And um, there's going to be an implied crucially, moral judgment that the moral, the morally salient information bears negatively on acts of that type. So that morally salient information speaks against doing that sort of thing um, in, ooh, in such a way that one, in this case, the, the colleague ought to include that acts of that type are, are morally impermissible. So here's a, a simple example. So suppose Annie stamps on, on Bevan's, Bevan's foot and Bevan calls Annie out and just says that, I don't know, there's an audience watching this foot stamping. Um, so in my view, so Bevan could, so assert the, the non-moral proposition, Annie, your act caused me pain. This is the act description. Bevan shares the experience of, of being in pain or, or 
from either Annie's action in particular or relevantly similar actions. That's the morally salient information. And there's the implication that the mere the fact that foot stamping has caused pain should lead Annie to include that stamping on other people's foot is impermissible. And that's the um, implied moral judgment. So I think that what makes, I think all of that's cool and I'm, I'm happy that I figured it out and came up with it. Um, I mean, not on my own, I had a lot of help. But I think what makes callouts valuable is that they can function to morally educate others. This morally salient information is a resource that the colleague can use to improve their moral judgment going forward. Um, so the caller is aiming to provide the colleague with reasons for why that called out action is morally impermissible. And if, if that works, if that goes through, then the colleague is going to be morally improved in some sense. They, they've learned something. Now, it is a limited sense. Um, successful call-outs can, I think, prompt the colleague to, to kind of recalibrate particular moral judgments, maybe even like a cluster of local moral judgments that bear on the permissibility of the called out action or acts of that type. Um, but I don't think they can prompt wholesale character change. Um, so there's no like lightning bolt of like, oh, I'm a better person. You know, it's not like his heart and his heart grew three sizes that day. Um, so we, we in fact shouldn't be surprised um, if people are quote unquote repeat offenders um, because the power of calling out isn't, isn't enough to prompt global character change. Um, so you might be thinking at this point, okay, this is great, but why does it have to be public, right? Is, you know, why do we have to do it in public? Um, and you might propose, well, well, calling in. That's the, so this is the private analog to calling out um, where instead of, you know, I think you just remove publicity, uh, but everything else would, would more or less stay the same. But I wanna argue that it's the publicity of callouts that allows many callers to engage in moral criticism at all. And here's why. Um, so if we opt for a practice of calling in, then that will require to call in people, we'll need to be able to communicate with them privately. And in general, we don't communicate private with, privately with strangers. Uh, that's, I mean, like you can like DM a stranger, but they're probably not gonna read it unless they really like wanna ruin their day. Okay. And I think that this, so this prevents criticism um, because there are these contingent features of our social reality that make it such that we aren't often going to encounter people and know people well who have, are gonna have access to different pools of morally salient information than we do. We're gonna know people like us. Um, we're gonna be siloed. And in some sense, we, we seem to prefer this. This is why we get echo chambers and, and filter bubbles. Uh, so that this new morally salient information, information that is going to be, is going to make this moral change possible in the colleague seems like it can only come from people who are not like them. They're somebody different. And what calling out does is it allows the, the caller to break through that um, to like just bulldoze a chain of communication to the callee um, by making the call out public. So in sum, I think that, that call outs convey this important information to the callee, in particular morally salient information that's relevant to the moral permissibility of the called out action. And in so doing, the caller's aim is to help the colleague improve morally. So this is the, the communicative project. And that I think makes call outs plausibly a form of, of moral education. Um, and that is what makes call outs, I think, uniquely valuable.
I don't see how we can replicate uh, that particular function and those results with any other practice. Thank you. Also, right on money. Oh, that's first. Thank you so much. All right. So, as promised, we have a second student who will come and speak about her experience with the Car Center and the research that she and her team do um, for our podcast, so Chapel Hill podcast. Um, and without further ado, here's Campbell. Hey all, my name is Campbell Lindquist, and I am a fellow of the Car Center this year. This is my second year at the Car Center, and I'm Nick, which is very exciting. Um, so I'm an executive with the podcast pod, Chapel Hill, and we are the podcast for actually three students at UNC. So this is my first time doing any kind of podcasting, so it's been a semester of learning on the go. Um, my co Zach and I created a model for how we wanted to produce episodes, and we've been working through that this semester. We were really intentional at the beginning with taking time to onboard and train um, and team build so that we could actually create a space where a meaningful and purposeful conversation could actually be had. Um, then we separated into triads, we did pitches, we selected a topic, we did uh, initial research, we came back together, made an outline, picked speakers, um, and then went back for more targeted research. Um, and then the speaking group um, met last week to do a mock podcast and flesh out the outline again. Um, and they are recording this week, which is very exciting. Um, so we will have an episode by the end of the semester. We're not planning on releasing it until spring semester, so look out for that. Um, but we'll take the break to tweak our model. Um, and then I hope we start like, rolling out episodes next semester. We're hoping to do one a month or one um, a month and a half. Um, and yeah, that's my spiel on the podcast. If you're not involved with the person, you definitely should be. That's how I found my family at UNC. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to Professor Holsley. I am in her class this semester and it's absolutely fascinating. And she is wonderful, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, so if you have the opportunity to take her, you definitely should. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna switch our um, presentations. And so next we have John. Uh, John is a third year doctoral student in the Department of Religious Studies at UNC and a graduate of UNC School of Law. Um, his research interests include contemporary philosophy of religion in Iran, Muslim uh, perceptions of Aristotle, and progressive Islamic thought. So, here's John. It's a professional goal of mine to have an introduction like Essence, which is <laughs> so illustrious, and some of us are just dipping our toes into things. Um, okay, so we've got this. Okay. It's like I might accidentally beam myself up into a Star Trek vessel or something. But okay. Um, thank you all for, for being here. Thank you to the Car Center and the philosophy department for organizing this. I'm honored to be among the other um, co-participants. And I've attended a number of riveting talks in this um, room. It's very different, much more terrifying to be on this side of the podium, I will say. But um, in any case, as you've gathered, my uh, topic will be um, on contemporary uh, debates and controversies among Muslim intellectuals on the very foundations of ethics. Um, and I'll unpack some of these terms at, on this title slide as I go along. Um, so we'll be discussing um, sort of three interrelated questions. The first one, um, what do Muslim moral theorists assert about grounding of moral values? Um, what makes something right or wrong? Um, and what role does God play in that process? Secondly, is there consistency across time or historical variability about how that question is answered? Um, about what makes something good or evil. And then finally, um, looking at the modern discussions, what consequences or implications are there in current philosophical work um, in this area by Muslim uh, scholars? Um, we'll be talking a lot about uh, norms 
uh, in this and one little subversion here that I'll that I'll draw attention to. Oh, excellent. Okay, so I figured that out. Is um, one uh, common perception is that uh, Muslims don't uh, depict the Prophet Muhammad. And that's actually more of a, a modern anxiety that's been projected into the past. So in this uh, presentation, I'll have a few um, images of Muhammad that were lovingly produced by Muslim artists or Muslim audiences. And this is one such example. We have Muhammad here um, surrounded by, don't worry, it's a harmless flame, uh, a sort of a Near Eastern version of a halo. Um, there who's receiving a uh, revelation from the Archangel Gabriel. And that'll become, the relevance of this will become um, clear in a couple of slides. Okay. So a few expectations that uh, prevail in the literature around Islamic ethics, and particularly in the role of God in determining moral norms among theorists. So one uh, that one often finds even, as I said, in academic literature, is a sort of assumption that God is the author and determiner determiner of moral norms, the decider, if that's a word, of what's moral and what's not. And a, a word for that that one pack of it is a divine command theory. A second sort of um, uh, assumption and presupposition um, in, in the scholarly literature at times is that prophetic figures are um, just clear-cut uh, communicators of what the divine will is uh, unto matters of morality, and that as a consequence of that, scripture itself is a repository of timeless moral truths. And I'm not going to suggest that these are, are baseless, but that they are underrepresentative of historical thought and um, obscure both uh, differences of opinion in the past and important um, new movements in the present. So um, let's uh, discuss this in a little bit more depth. Um, so this notion of divine command theory, which some of you may already be well familiar with, is the idea that morality and moral norms, the content of moral claims, exist and are made possible by some act of God, or if nothing else, the existence of God. Um, and so this, this discussion, uh, very early on in, in um, philosophical history became the center of a particularly famous debate. Many of you um, are probably well familiar with this as well. Some of you read this, uh, I would say read this in the Greek with me, but more read it to me in the Greek uh, for the summer um, as I was trying to make my way through it. In any case, we have the figure of Socrates here in a um, Islamic miniature form teaching a couple of his, his bright students. I'm sure one of those is Plato. I do not know which one. Um, in any case, um, so this figure, this platonic dialogue emerges where Socrates, whom we've already heard about today, is being accused of corrupting the youth. And he encounters the sort of religious functionary uh, named Euthyphro after whom this dialogue is named. And um, Euthyphro himself is bringing a legal cause of action against his own father. And I, I don't recommend that um, unless you have good cause, but just uh, it's in any case, um, he has a sort of smug self-satisfaction that his father, who has sort of um, been negligent, such as to cause the death of a servant, should be brought to justice, as we like to say. And um, Socrates really hits him with a, this really great one-liner uh, that's gone down in the history books. Um, about whether or not Euthyphro understands why what he's doing is in fact the proper right course of action. And Socrates asks, is the pious loved by the gods because it is pious? Or is it pious because it is loved by the gods? If we reframe this a little bit in maybe more familiar language, does God command a particular action because it's morally right in and of itself? independently of God, or is it morally right only because God happened to command it? And so both of these are tough pills to swallow for a number of philosophers and theologians alike. In the former case, um, it appears as though God is merely affirming what was already a moral truth, and that God doesn't have necessarily a lot of freedom or power to choose something different, that God is constrained by something outside of God's self. 
I'm trying not to gender the divine, but it's sounding weird. In any case, uh, the second option is that God can declare essentially anything to be morally uh, obligatory or morally uh, reprehensible, but this gives the feeling of arbitrariness to morality, that we could be um, morally obligated to do something heinous like go to Duke, and that we would have no ability to bat an eyelash. It would just be God's complete prerogative um, to, um, to, uh, to do so. And so these are sorts of the sort of foundational um, points. For how this works its way into Islamic thought, I'll draw attention to the massive efforts to bring Platonic, Aristotelian, Galenic, um, and uh, uh, scholarship among many other figures in the sort of Athenian uh, philosophical tradition into Arabic, typically through these Syriac manuscripts, which uh, Nestorian Christian communities have who are living in Muslim majority lands. Um, and so this is an image of actually uh, Aristotle there on the right, teaching his um, student, um, Alexander. And so this bringing in of almost the entirety of the extant Aristotelian corpus brought new methodologies, new questions, and it produced the first school of Islamic ethics that had a distinct identity known as the Mu'tazilis. Um, and they, to show you, just to prove how serious they were about ethics, they called themselves the Ahlul Adl wal Tawheed, um, the people of justice and monotheism, or divine unity, I should say. And so they even put this notion of justice, even before in their moniker, um, the idea of the oneness of God. Um, and they took the second half of that Euthyphro dilemma and ran with it, swallowed hard, and just went on ahead to say that it would be logically impossible or perhaps meta-ethically impossible for God to decree something morally, uh, to, to decree a morally unjust norm, that such norms do exist, that human beings have the ability to sort of discover them through our rational capabilities, and then that um, God is in a position merely of affirming those. And so it emphasized this ability of human reason to access moral truth, setting aside divinity um, to a very powerful way. And the, first, the sort of father, I suppose, of Arabic philosophy, Al-Kindi, represented here, not looking his best, um, is, uh, uh, was a participant, or at least sympathetic to this school of, of, um, of basically negotiating this uh, difficult uh, portion of the dilemma. Okay. So we'll just casually skip ahead like a millennium uh, to the near present, to a group of individuals who um, are in many ways reprising and expanding this tradition of moral reasoning, particularly around the role that God plays in moral norm formation. Um, that's great, activating warp speed. Okay, so, um, <laughs> well, no, we, uh, so one thing that sometimes emerges is that uh, I spoke with people who were surprised that the sort of nexus, the core, the heart of neo-rationalist thought about ethics might occur in the Islamic Republic of Iran of all places. And um, it's worth noting that historically Iran and Iraq as a sort of, oops, as a connected uh, whole were often the seat of rationalist inquiry in, in Muslim majority context. Any place that produced Ihsan must have a good pedigree for intellectual production. And in the 20th century, Kant and Heidegger were, had a real life as celebrities in the intellectual realm as uh, Plato and Aristotle did for medieval Muslims. So our figures here are Abdul Karim Sarosh on the top and Muhammad Mujtahid Shabistari on the bottom, coming from different backgrounds. The former, a um, a pharmacologist turned philosopher of science, the, the latter a more traditional um, Islamic theologian. And so how do they intervene and build upon that earlier Mutazili um, position? The main instance is reconfiguring, I'm gonna skip over that, um, the, the moral authority of the prophets. Um, and that was just Muhammad meeting previous prophets in the Hebrew biblical tradition. 
Um, and so the main contribution that these figures have added is a humanistic reading of what it means to be a prophet and what revelation from God looks like. Um, and so rather than the sort of dictation view that a prophet hears words from God and that are sort of pre-approved and just communicates them rotely to their audience, the prophet is involved in actually um, subjectively and creatively responding to a mystical experience, forming a formless encounter with divinity and trying to communicate that to their audience, um, to their community. So it's an alternative way of understanding what prophets do. It's not this sort of what my professor likes to say, the FedEx view of prophecy, where you're like, thank you, message received. I will now tell what God wants, but rather an organic experience. And um, the figure on the bottom of the previous slide uses the German blick uh, to indicate what the prophet actually receives in this mystical uh, encounter, a sort of outlook or an impression of divine sublimity. Okay, so what role does this have in connecting with our meta-ethical questions? Well, firstly, it makes the Quran something other than the, a transcript of sort of a divine, a, a divine script. Um, Sorush here likes to use the Quranic character of the honeybee as a metaphor for the prophets. A parrot simply, uh, I mean, this is, a little bit disrespectful to parrots, but a parrot, in a sense, repeats what it hears. It may or may not understand. I'll give it some benefit of the doubt. But the honeybee does something quite different. It you, activates its own intellect and skills and instrumentalities to produce its sort of um, its craft. And just as a honeybee's uh, honey represents various characteristics of its context in the flavor, in the flowers that, go, that nourish it, in the color, that sort of thing. Sorosh uh, emphasizes how works of prophecy, including the Muslim scriptures, are really uh, profoundly um, representative of the sort of knowledges and forms of life that existed in Muhammad's community. His own personality as a prophet is built in. So to, to begin to wrap up here, thinking about this discourse. Um, it's a second order destabilization of divine command theory to say that even if God could determine what was morally right and wrong in a sort of voluntaristic way, that a scripture would be inadequate for even determining that to begin with, because it's so much tied up with the, the contingent, subjective, creative process of this prophet who's really like the honeybee using their own just happenstantial, I'm not sure if that's a word, um, characteristics and intellect and the like to produce their moral teachings. So if not, um, if not divine command theory, where do these scholars look for grounding all important moral claims, perhaps a moral Platonism, that moral truths just exist as brute facts about the world, or contractualism, um, these sorts of things. But in general, this prophetological point kind of reduces the urgency of establishing some sort of non-divine source of morality. Okay, uh, very last slide. Um, so one thing that I'll finally want to emphasize is um, the, the view that this may all feel very radical and very reformist and the like, to say that the Quran is not the, the word of God, but just the response to a mystical experience. But this in many ways gives too much to the view that there's a very stable Islam that some particular scholars are seeking to revise. When in fact, um, as this very dense text uh, would, would, would teach us, um, there's always been a tremendous amount of innate and lovely contradiction and harm and disharmony in Muslim theorizing. And in many ways, these contemporary ways of destabilizing um, divine command theory have resonances with uh, past schools of philosophy, mysticism, law, and ethics of the sorts that I've discussed. So um, I think that is all. <laughs>
Um, thank you all so much. So, what? so many devices here. I know. I'll steal this laptop too if I'm okay. just kidding. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. So, um, we don't have another student um, talk to you. Me. Um, I just wanted to, if you're not already involved with the Car Center, which I know a good portion of you are, um, I'll just tell you briefly about how you can be involved. Um, so, we have the Ethics Recruit. Um, program that is still taking um, individuals as a rolling basis. Um, applications take maybe, maybe 10 minutes if you're like really grammar checking. Um, but what the ethics recruits do, um, it's an introductory way to get more into ethics of the field of ethics. If you feel like maybe, you know, you're not quite ready to take the full leap, but you'd love to attend more events like this, talk with other students who are more involved. Um, so we have events like this, we have evening meetings, and then you actually get the chance to work with some of the students who spoke earlier um, on the projects. Um, there are tasks that they need help with, and if any recruit would like to do so, volunteer to do that. So it's a way to get involved right now, do things right now or after finals. Um, but um, We'd love to have you, and I'd love to talk with anyone who's interested afterwards. But we have one more fantastic speaker up um, before we go, and before hopefully insomnia for peace arrive. <laughs> to be determined. Um, so, Alex is the director of the National High School Ethics Bowl, headquartered in the Par Center, uh, working at the intersections of ethics, political philosophy, and the philosophy of education. Alex is an award-winning teacher and a strong advocate for public and pre-college philosophy pedagogy. Alex's philosophical work focuses on the liberal virtue of civility and its role in non-ideal politics of democratic societies like our own. He received his PhD from the University of Tennessee Knoxville in 2021. So here is Alex. Here. Someone just left it on there. I don't know who did that. That's fine. That could be my job. So, hey, everybody. I'm, I'm super glad to be here. Thanks to, to Sally for the invitation to, to talk with you all. Um, so, the work I'm going to present today is, is a very quick uh, sort of portion of my doctoral dissertation, which I completed just a few months ago. So. Much of this is still kind of live in my mind, and, and some parts of it are even still a little provisional and rough around the edges, as those of you who are working on dissertations will probably understand at a very deep level. Um, so I'd be happy to hear your, your sort of thoughts, impressions, and feedback over cookies afterwards, or hopefully cookies. Um, so my work engages with the liberal idea of civility, which I think we can all agree at some level has a pretty important place in political theory and perhaps in our politics as well. That place has historically been, at least within the liberal tradition, largely the purview of ideal theory. The society that we actually live in, you might think, uh, isn't. That is to say, our own circumstances are characterized by sufficient non-compliance with some basic politically liberal ideas about justice that the role of even a closely held notion like civility, I think, raises some important questions and challenges. So I want to talk today about how we should think about civility, or maybe more importantly, how we shouldn't, um, under a society characterized by a long history of oppression, where a clear goal of our political thinking is, or at least should be, um, ameliorating that oppression as it exists in the lives of real people. So how does oppression work? I'm not going to spend too much time on this for the sake of time, uh, but we'll say just a couple of things to kind of frame up the problem. Uh, assuming this works. Um, so I draw pretty heavily on the, on the work of Iris Marion Young and, and Hud in understanding group oppression as involving a systemic kind of structural harm against citizens' opportunities to develop and exercise the basic capacities that they have. This framework is, is pretty intersectional. It can be used to think about class and gender and sexuality and more. 
But my primary focus in my project has been on racial oppression. I argue somewhat unoriginally uh, that, that Black Americans experience systemic oppression across various domains of life. This includes, of course, the economic sphere, the political arena, culturally and, and often physically, violently. Um, much of this comes together, unfortunately, at the site of criminal justice and policing, where Black Americans in particular are significantly more likely than their white counterparts to be involved with the criminal justice system in the first place, but also to be disproportionately abused, disenfranchised, harmed, or even in cases killed by them. So a useful resource to kind of frame this up for thinking about our circumstances with respect to racial oppression uh, comes from a taxonomy developed by Tommy Shelby, who I believe will be the Maynard Adams Symposium speaker in the spring. So if you're around in the spring, you'll have a chance to talk with Professor Shelby. Um, so he argues that there are essentially three options when assessing a, a society for its basic sort of structural justice. On option one, society is fundamentally just in the sense that constitutional liberties and some level of equal opportunity are comprehensively available for all citizens. Um, I'm going to follow Shelby uh, in assuming that that just isn't the case in our own society because of the history of oppression and uh, uh, related phenomena that I mentioned before. On option two, society isn't itself unjust. It's oriented sort of at the right ideals, but some reform might be needed to sort of deal with persisting injustices over time. In option three, where things get interesting, uh, society is fundamentally unjust. There, on Shelby's view, there are severe threats to equal citizenship for substantial portions of the population. So throughout my own project, a really interesting field where I'm working is between options two and three. Right, so the contention is something like our own circumstances with racial oppression are sufficiently non-ideal, such that our thinking ought to occupy this space between two and three, what Shelby calls the limit of tolerable injustice, beyond which some kind of radical or transformative change of our, of our society's fundamentals is necessary. So given the forms of oppression that I mentioned and what has become unfortunately a common image of them unfolding on American streets, I contend that we're at least approaching that limit, assuming we have not reached it already. So in this sort of clearly non-ideal space, I think there are two kind of general ways in the history of liberalism that we might think about the project of resisting or ameliorating oppression. On the one hand, the sort of classical framework of civil disobedience. On the other hand, the sort of more radical and total, you might think, idea of responding to oppression with political violence, which is to say revolutionary violence. Spoiler alert, I think there are pretty deep problems with both of these frameworks, uh, such that I don't think a kind of pick one and go approach is going to work here. Um, so I'll turn to a few of those problems before saying just a little bit about how I'm going to synthesize some what I think are some important conceptual resources from each of these kind of frameworks. So civil disobedience is the first. When we think of civil disobedience, we probably imagine images like this one, a peaceful sit-in in Greensboro during the civil rights movement where Black Americans in their Sunday best, calmly, civilly, perhaps even politely, demand to be treated the same as their white counterparts during an era of legal segregation. So to understand the sort of civil resistance that happened during that era, I find it helpful to draw on a, on a couple of important thinkers. So developing what has become the kind of prevailing sort of political theoretical account of civil disobedience in the 1970s, John Rawls here on the left was greatly influenced by the actual political programs of resistance coming out of the civil rights movement, such as those pursued by Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers there on the right um, at the height of that movement. So King, a pastor, um, famously advocated a kind of reverent nonviolence in protest. He's now kind of lionized among the greats of human history for that. We hear about it every time a protest erupts. He now serves as a kind of ultimate moral exemplar or protest done right. So thinking about the ways that King's work and accomplishments are appropriated and, and I argue often misappropriated helps to kind of shape my worries about the civility framework which has largely grown out of the movement that he led. So to put it colloquially, to sort of like, I have some light beef with civil disobedience and this is, this is how we'll describe it. Um, I think our understanding of the civil rights movement problematically elevates the element of civility over the element of disobedience in terms of relative moral importance. This is concerning for a few reasons. Some of those have to do with 
the idea of getting our understanding of this movement right and seeing the accomplishments of that movement survive. We are importantly, I think, failing on both of those counts, but other reasons I think are deeply morally concerning in very different ways. Uh, the first is that the norms growing out of our understanding and perhaps more importantly, misunderstanding of the politics of the civil rights movement are often kind of unilateral in terms of who they address and demand civility from. Demands for greater civility in the second, in the second case um, can conveniently also kind of change the subject from the substance of the injustice being discussed to the mode of the discussion itself. This serves the status quo in a fairly convenient way and can serve to obscure the very trends of oppression that we might take ourselves as wanting to, to intervene in. Uh, if you doubt this, think about the Colin Kaepernick case, right? We're not talking about police violence, we're not talking about racial justice, we're talking about the methods of protest, the methods of communication. Finally, importantly, I think this is probably the most concerning thing, charges of incivility can be used to authorize harm against oppressed people who are resisting their oppression, as we saw in racial justice protests a couple of summers ago, right? That's particularly concerning when, you know, you wield, uh, as we do as a state, the power of a pretty vast uh, police uh, institution. So I think some rethinking of this idea is called for, but before we go there, recall at that limit of tolerable injustice, another option we might go for is a more radical approach, political violence. So I find this approach kind of wanting as well, but I, I want to say a little bit about why just completely abandoning civility isn't the way to go. So political violence, or at least a threat of it, had its place too in formative American social movements, in the activities of the Black Panther Party, and in the advocacy of more sort of radical civil rights leaders uh, like Malcolm X, uh, Stokely Carmichael, Angela Davis, and others. Um, as our circumstances with respect to this issue have arguably worsened over time, um, it has become a topic of discussion once more. Now, the idea of using political violence isn't as distant from us as we often tend to think. Uh, it's not a new one to us. In fact, it's fairly foundational. Our founding as a country wasn't just a declaration of independence. It was also, at the same time, a, a declaration of a revolutionary war. So here's a Jefferson passage from, from uh, the Declaration of Independence on a right to revolt uh, if the government is not serving the interests of the people. If violence can be used as a tool of oppression, we might ask, why not consider it an effective in-kind tool for resisting that oppression? But I wanna highlight some problems with this kind of framework too. Um, first, uh, this one's kind of technical, but the, the closest political philosophers typically come to justifying violence as a method of fighting oppression is the discussion of revolutionary violence in just war theory. There are some important problems that those attempts highlight. Most of them have to do with the sort of technicalities of attributing uh, sort of sufficient authority for the tactics to the revolutionary, either by securing consent on those of uh, those on behalf of whom they revolt or otherwise. Um, so some thinkers like Alan Buchanan, who unfortunately is a Duke, um, argue that this process is a, is a pretty sort of conceptually problem. A deeper concern to me, though, are the risks and unintended consequences of violence, namely the risks that it presents for the prospect of a stable society, the instability that can be caused by breaking down bonds of citizenship in favor of regarding fellow citizens as enemies to be defeated, right? The kinds of people uh, our, or the kinds of society we might become when taking on these tactics might be of, of sufficient concern to us. But even given these problems, though, I think there's something instructive and, and perhaps constructive about this kind of thinking, which I further developed a little down the road. So if I were going to sum up my criticisms and move to the kind of constructive part of my process uh, project in a shorthand way, I want to point out that each of these frameworks tends to isolate or obscure the purpose of political resistance in some weird ways. In the case of the civil disobedience framework and the kind of civility politics that's grown out of it, I think political resistance is primarily located in the space of discourse. Resistance is construed as a kind of communicative act, right? The most important considerations have to do with tone, mode of address, and other social and discursive forms. But on the other end, the political violence framework tends to render political resistance as being primarily about the exercise of power, where power is wielded unjustly 
the oppressed, we might say, are justified in responding in kind with force of their own, where the goal is to sort of displace and ultimately replace the power structure with one that is more just. So I've mentioned some reasons to be skeptical of each of these frames in isolation, and I want to contend that a proper account of political resistance should kind of have a foot in both of these spaces. So what I call constructive political resistance should be concerned with both the discursive norms governing how we address acts of resistance and the important power dynamics that undergird those norms. So to put it shortly, uh, who gets to be included in the space of politics, how they exercise their voice, power, and influence is equally important, if not more so in states like our own, to the modes in which they do that. So when oppressed people are systematically excluded from the space of political discourse by some of the governing norms of that very discourse, for lack of a better analogy, I argue that they're justified in breaking in. So given this picture, my approach takes seriously some, some conceptual resources from each of these frameworks. Coming out of the discussion of, of civility politics, I want to emphasize a notion I call political constructiveness, which has at its heart the sort of liberal ideals of reciprocity and intelligibility to one's fellow citizens, which try to get at those sort of discursive questions. And from the discussion of political violence, I bring forward that notion of transformative social change that becomes relevant when a society oppresses its subject, right? I think we should keep in sight the kind of change that's typical of more total or violent responses to oppression, one that goes beyond reform and toward the necessary element of kind of repudiating uh, oppressive structures and institutions, and ultimately, of course, replacing them. Um, I'll sort of gloss over a couple of examples really quickly of the kinds of things that I think occupy this interesting space of both uncivil and politically constructive. Um, one example that, are, that I have in mind are um, the tactics employed by the ACT UP movement during the HIV epidemic in the 1980s. Um, they did pretty sensational things like holding die-ins in churches and burning Ronald Reagan in effigy. They threw the ashes of cremated AIDS victims on the lawn of the White House, and in a particularly memorable instance, which we watched last night at the fellowship meeting, they put a massive 15-foot condom over a U.S. senator's house, right? Um, these things are, are sort of markedly uncivil in that they're sort of transgressive about topics that we generally don't address with anything but the utmost of care in our politics, sex and death and the relation thereof. Right? These are sort of taboos that are kind of interesting to play with. And it's no accident, on my view at least, that the ACT UP movement has proven to be a remarkably durable and effective protest. Another sort of quick example of tactics that I'm interested in are some of the more transgressive tactics of the Black Lives Matter movement. Things like looting storefronts, setting fire to police stations, and so on. Um, I won't say too much about this, and we can just talk about it over cookies, but in short, I, I think we can certainly find and track an underlying logic to protesters' targeted destruction of property in cases like this one, which is from Minneapolis last summer. So when met with unprovoked warlike violence, the, you know, deployment of paramilitary equipment uh, and tactics typically reserved for combatants in war zones, the torching of a symbol that sort of underlies that power serves an important politically constructive purpose. So where does this approach leave us at the end of the day? And I'm almost done, I promise. Um, with respect to resisting oppression, if I were gonna sloganize a set of high level recommendations, I, I might use something like the language of civic radicalism, which can be sort of defined by both its adherence to some core principles of political liberalism and its critical distance from other norms which have developed out of that same tradition. So my approach is broadly civically minded in, in its aim to sort of center and reinforce the status of the citizen and to promulgate a greater sense of justice as well as the corresponding ability to sort of spot and respond to injustice. The approach is radical insofar as it takes seriously those claims uh, that are critical of liberalism from the perspective of anti-oppression politics. Um, in response, the idea is to sort of trouble norms of civility and political advocacy that are common in, in political liberalism. So these projects, as, as I hope to demonstrate here, are not fundamentally artificial, but actually complementary to the core sort of political spirit and, and liberatory potential of political liberalism. So to this end, I, I recommend, and this is my last slide, 
two central initiatives approaching the problem of oppression as it were from both ends. So given the kind of non-ideal framing of the project, I think we should approach the problem from below by rethinking the way that we evaluate resistance to oppression and emphasizing those acts which are constructive in the ways that my examples might sketch, uh, even if not always civil. Insofar as we should want to be a forward-looking society, which is better uh, than, than our own, um, I, I think it's also important to emphasize the, the sort of approach the problem from above idea with civic education programs which inculcate and reproduce a sense of justice, as well as that ability to spot injustice, as well as those norms of reciprocity and recognition, I argue, are so central. So in short, uh, be constructive in your protest and do ethics book. <laughs> Yes, you rushed me, now give us cookies. 